I'm going to pick up on a couple of things uh, which may be, uh, to start with, just the obvious one or two things about the foundation, but on other things that may not have been dis discussed so much. And it's really a prompt for some uh, dialogue at the end, even if it might be a little bit difficult over the distance, but let's see if we see if it can work. Now, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, as many of you probably know, specializes in, in encouraging the transition to a circular economy, and it really works in these four areas. Uh, fairly expected uh, insights, getting the evidence together that, that circular economy could be useful and productive, education, connecting with business and government, and uh, communicating more broadly. A fifth area we do a lot of at the moment is these very systemic initiatives around plastics and uh, around fibers, and we're moving into looking at uh, food even more. So that's a little bit of the background, but I have a sort of privileged position in the foundation that I can go a little broader and hopefully pick up some interesting thoughts. So just to confess that we do have um, an interest in discussing the circular economy and getting something happening, so we're not exactly, we're not exactly neutral, but I would say that we are uh, an interested and open party to these discussions. Now, some people would say, well, what's it all about except for the practical things that you already know? And I've just listed four I want to play with very shortly. I'm, I'll try not to do too many slides which are just texty. But for, for me and for many others, this is part of an evolution of thinking. It's, a, it's around complexity science, which means those systems which have got lots of feedback in them. And yes, that, that's part of the thinking that's been evolving for 30 years or more. The second one, it is part of an opportunity for uh, the business case, the economic case to come through. A lot of it to do with digital. I've just been learning a little bit more about uh, <coughs> renting your dog and uh, and Fat Llama I had come across already, but uh, there's lots of new stuff around. The third point I want to emphasize is you can't just do one thing with the circular economy. We've known, I think, for 25 years or more, that there are four basic shifts that need to come together, and that the enabling conditions are absolutely crucial. And the last one is, and Bill McDonough and people like that, Cradle to Cradle and elsewhere, have long made it the point that it's, it's by design. It's by design and intention. It's not by wondering what to do at the end of the pipe. Oh, I've got some waste, what can I do with it? Yes, you can do that, people do do that, and you can get added value. But ultimately, the idea is to design that problem out by creating, uh, if you like, nutrient cycle. Now, some people see it really very differently. They just, uh, it's resource efficiency. They're not interested in the philosophy. They're not interested in the four shift. And they are interested in what do they do with their waste. Now, I can understand that because it's, it's like saying, well, look, the economy just works. Uh, my job is to make sure I can do something here and now, get stuff done, and, and not, to, not to back off into uh, the bigger picture. But I think that's a missed opportunity, really. Yes, you can do that. But if the economy is rather complex, or rather more complex than many people um, wish to acknowledge, it might not make much of a difference. Let me illustrate this. First of all, where does the circular economy come from in terms of thinking? It's really these, I put together these six, call it schools of thought if you like, but the, except for Walter Starham, they all have in mind a different way of thinking. They're systems thinkers, and they do take in their model of what the economy might look like as insights from living systems. And you have to understand complexity science, and I guess you do. Now that might sound a bit of a throwaway comment, but actually most of us are pretty poor at the complexity science, including me. But if this is a way, different way of looking at the world, which is based on real world systems which are full of complexity, we need a few more insights into those uh, to be able to come up with ideas which are more uh, system-wide. And we'll come back to that a little later. But 
I suppose we're doing this. It's raising new questions, new possibilities. It's looking at what we can all see, but it requires some creative imagination to make a real advance. And I often call it the macroscope, which is not my term, but we know all about telescopes, we know all about microscopes, but we very rarely stand back enough to drop the detail and see that bigger picture, the infinitely complex, but without all the detail to confuse us. That's a, that's a real skill. And, and if you're talking circular economy, it's a skill you have to have in a way because you're putting it together uh, elements in a different way to get good results. We all know about take, make, and dispose. That's fair enough. We also know that the economy, has, in terms of resource prices, has been a bit up and down, to say the least. Uh, it's a bit on the up at the moment um, and in some key elements, materials, but the, the promised we're running out of resources, that didn't happen and it won't happen. What might happen, it gets too expensive to afford. We might not be able to afford oil above about $100 a barrel. And yet we can't extract it from the ground profitably much, much below $50 a barrel in most places. So you're stuck between top and bottom. And although we're never going to run out of aluminium, the aluminium price is on the climb again after a very severe drop. So we've got volatility in the resources market, so we don't know quite where we'll be. But that volatility can be worrying. The, the economy's got other complexities to it. Just want to mention this because sometimes people get really stuck on just the materials. If we're talking about changing an economy, it's going to include problems such as this one. Productivity, this is for the US, and productivity of workers has continued to increase since the 1970s, but their wage rates, their compensation overall has not. So the idea of an economy that productivity and wage rates kept in step as it did really from the end of the Second World War, that broke down about the middle end of the 70s and means that production is getting easier, but uh, uh, the benefits of it are not being shared between much of the workforce uh, and, and the producers. We all know about this one. We'd really like to work from home, but preferably for somebody else. There are real tensions around employment and the nature of employment. The gig economy has no doubt been mentioned several times. Work is getting more precarious. Our wage rates are not uh, going up that much. and Long-term work is is in decline compared to part-time contract. So the economy is more than obviously production and consumption. It's things like uh, labor, it's things like uh, indebtedness, it's things like um, the impact of technologies. But we can't deal with all of those, yet we have to, it seems, do something about this trend. The growth rate is poor and it's on the decline in a long-term long-term decline. Since the 60s in, in the OECD countries, or the top 13 of them. So we've got an economy that's got resource problems, it's got potentially employment problems in terms of full-time employment and uh, substantial uh, incomes. It's got problems in terms of growth overall and you've got all the big environmental problems too. Well, fair enough, but you cannot just isolate one of these and say, okay, we can we can fix it with a circular economy if it's just about materials. So this is only part of the discussion of what might make living better. And I always like picking up on the designers like Buckminster Fuller here. This has been a quote that's inspired uh, many people, but a lot of people at the foundation have been very taken by this. You build a new model that makes the existing one obsolete. So don't just keep hacking around at variations of what you used to do. Think it through. Eisenhower once said, if you've got a tricky problem, expand it. In other words, if you get a bigger picture, you can often see the way through. Don't keep going down the rabbit hole looking for the answer. So here's the new economy. We all knew that in this room, I'm sure. Energy through, material cycle, powered by solar. It's very much, uh, it's, it's circular in a material sense. It's throughput in terms of energy. Some people do forget that. I don't know why, because it's pretty obvious that the only Thing only works because of the throughput of energy. And in imitation of that, I suppose, this is what we're familiar with. 
Uh, but I will show one variation here. This is a sort of linear economy on the left, take, make, and dispose, as we know all understand. But a lot of people don't want to talk about money and debt as part of the economy. It has a real active function in how it turns out. So even if you shift towards a more circular economy, which is solar powered rather than fossil fuel powered, which has two distinct cycles, so that it makes it nutritious, if you like. You've got the biological cycle and the technical one. The technical one is what we do as human artifice. <clears throat> There's still a question of how the money system would work with that. <clears throat> Excuse me. But not too many clear answers about that. So we're exploring an area. We're exploring the edges of the new economy. And we can't just, can't just talk about materials, in my view. This is the famous diagram you may have seen a few times, probably today or maybe. The only thing I want to pull out of this one, this butterfly diagram, is that we know from the research that the more you can maintain capital, and particularly on the right-hand side, the, the value of manufactured products intact, if you can ex get extended product life, or you can up their utilization, the better it is in terms of business returns, or it's likely to be. And this worries some people because they say, look, I'm in the recycling business, that looks way out on the periphery. Yes, it is way out on the periphery. The returns are not good. Not out there. Yeah, you have to have it. But that's part of that change of view. Walter Steinhoff says the circular economy is about stock maintenance, not throughput. It's a, he says that caring is at the heart of the circular economy. Because you're caring for both, for all of these things, uh, the, the coherence of society, you're caring for human capital. You're preserving your manufactured capital to get the most use out of it at the highest quality. You're maintaining the uh, environment. That, that, if you like, the environmental services, that stock. So that's why he talks about the circular economy as a shift from throughput to capital maintenance. And that's also a clue to the business value as well, clearly. Here's somebody else's, and not ours, clue to, they wanted to make, I think everybody's used to three or four R's, I think they just wanted ten as a round number, and they all begin with R, and they've been working hard to make it work, but you can see some of that shift. So, just to pick up on what I said before, recycling's pretty low down on the, on the priorities list. There's more value, more potential the further up you go, and I think one of the big changes because the circular economy has evolved from lots of previous thinking, is the digital lets us reimagine how we might do so many of these things. They were always there, but they were rather niche. And this is by design. This gets some people a little bit worried, uh, in a sense that, well, I don't control all of the cycle, but if all of the cycle doesn't work, what you're really doing is a bit of resource efficiency. So I've written in large letters to the right, in case you can't see the slide too clearly, the, the smaller elements there, but Brown Garden McDonald said that you need to define the pathways with where are your materials going to, in terms of how are they dealt with. This is on the biological side. They've got to be fit to go back to the forest, if you like, in an ideal. You've got to define the use time. It isn't getting something to last as long as possible. I do have in my cupboard a 1991 working Macintosh computer, but you know, I don't use it. You know, it's just a nightmare regarding the software. So there's no particular value in keeping things going just for the sake of it. McDonough and Browngard talk about a defined use period. In other words, it has a plan for its working life, and then it's designed to be done something else with. And they also define the materials and the ingredients so that you have a pretty clear idea of what cradle to cradle mean. Now that's a mixture between a designer, Madonna, and Brown Gart, the chemist. And I think that has been very useful to bring us to where we are. I wanted to go back to 1999, which is about the time that um, Cradle to Cradle was written, just to mention these four things. You need four things, said uh, Lovins and Hawking, back in 99. You need radical resource efficiency, shift from goods to services. Waste has got to become food, and you need to invest in natural capital. Now, 
You can't just pick, oh, I do radical resource efficiency. You're not going to get a circular economy that way because it's a systemic change. All of these four are needed because they reinforce each other. Uh, yeah, we've made progress, particularly on one around the time the book was done and more since. And the internet and digital as letters do a lot more of the shift from goods to services. So we're on the way, but really making waste into food and really regenerating uh, landscapes, agricultural systems, we're quite a long way from all of that. But talking of digital, again, this was even a few years ago now, uh, Peter Lacey and people from Accenture. These are their top five circular economy type business models, and I put the, the arrows on there to sort of suggest the amount of digital uh, enabling in this. And three out of the five are very much uh, related to, to digital. You know, you've got the collaborative consumption, you've got products of services, and you've got, uh, you've got next life. Sales are pretty good, but they, they might include things like um, upgrading equipment with new control devices so that it's actually an improvement in the quality because you can change the control system. But products of service, that's been, uh, I'm sure, mentioned, and it does cover a huge range of things. Some people just think it's in the middle. You know, I rent something, I lease it. Oh, I've heard about that 30, 40 years ago. I've done it for decades. But there are a whole cluster of business models around that, and the only one that uh, really doesn't happen is the one on the far right. We haven't yet got a transporter uh, beam in our starships. But um, there's lots of interest in all of these. Many of them do not work to start with. Fat Llama is an example of something, somebody revisiting uh, the idea and doing it better. And so you'll see a lot of these things will fall over. And I don't mind that personally, because the, the direction is there. And if you can up the utilization of products and getting much more use out of it, that has to be a good thing if they're well designed, in their, if they're designed for disassembly and for effective reprocessing. So we may be, somebody says, moving from an era of stuff to an era of no stuff in terms of durables, not in the consumable sense. And that would probably be that would probably be welcome if there are the right protections for the user. I'm afraid politics always gets in here. Uh, just a couple of uh, quick e e examples of what's really exciting me. It's not just very big durables. Many people come across this, I assume. Lighting as a service, you go to Schiphol Airport, uh, the Lounge 3, there are tens of thousands of lights, but none of them are owned by Schiphol. They buy the service of lighting from a subsidiary of Philips. And so Philips can invest in the best quality light bulbs uh, and recover them. And they also get a better margin than if they'd sold the lights because it's a continual contract. It's not, oh, I've sold 10,000 light bulbs, see you in a year or two and I'll sell you a few spares. This is the maintenance contract as well. They get a good deal around the electricity consumed as well. And so they can build up their revenue by lowering costs. And yes, the problem with this is it demands a lot of business because, as I note on the right, you've got a completely different orientation. If you're part of a business that spends all its time selling stuff, not selling it looks like a real threat to your job, to the supply chain, to what, what you consider you should be doing with returns, how you relate to the customer. It seems like a nightmare. But that's the way it's going. A couple of fun things. Um, cradle to Cradle um, highlighted this, you know, and I've got a notebook on this. They're lovely. Actually, you don't have to use uh, wood to create a book. You can do it out of stone. Stone powder and a binding of waste polyeth polyethylene uh, can give you a beautiful surface to write on. And um, so, it's rethinking products. I just put a couple of items down there and, and um, I, I will be sending over the recording of this uh, if you want to pick up on it. But a Koya wood is fantastic. It's a bit like, you know, people play uh, conkers and they keep their conker or they, they treat them in uh, vinegar or, a, or 
a satellizing spirit like that, usually vinegar. They've done the equivalent with fairly cheap wood to make wood that's of engineering quality. I've seen that stuff and I've seen it in action. It is wonderful. So you can use the cheap wood to make hardwood. And um, that's a fantastic development inspired by Cradle to Cradle years ago. And there's also plenty of stuff around fashion. It's a big, it's a big element at the moment. And uh, Cradle to Cradle has uh, hundreds of products and we have about 150 case studies of business successes and failures uh, using the circular economy as a base. But there's plenty out there. But back to the systems. If it was just efficiency, if it was just doing things right, you go faster, you use less labor, less materials, that's a bit like saying the systems we have are like the, the main uh, branches in, in, this, uh, in this diagram, in this um, image here. Whereas, of course, it's not. An effective system is one that fits the system. It works at all scales. And that is really, really important because do you want effective systems or just efficient ones? It's a really important choice. Going to Pauli, one of the inspirations for circular economy, says, we don't want to, we want not ever lower costs, but to have a higher generation of value with what is available locally. There's an aspect here which is about building the local economy. Um, right. Here we go. Come to Power, it's got a not that easy to find book called The Blue Economy, though it's been published in many languages. Well, he brings up lots of ideas about building the economy from the base up, particularly developing nations, but don't let that put you off. One of his classic examples is the one around coffee, because it's almost all waste. You can effectively uh, grow mushrooms either on the waste, or you can grow it from the pulp. You can create animal feed. You can generate some energy from it, too. Uh, Biobean in London uh, extracts oils from coffee waste. We can see around both the developed and developing world much more interest in making much more of the materials. In other words, don't think of one cash flow, think of multiple cash flows. And so it's all good at all scales. And it's about all of the flows, information, energy, and materials. That's a circular economy uh, writ large, according to Gunter Fowler. Now, I just want to, to wrap up a couple of things. And go back to this idea of, do you want to eat the whole sandwich? Because a lot of people don't. But for other people, that's the reason they're interested in the circular economy. Because it has three elements to it. The one that everybody notices in the middle of the sandwich. These are sort of the rules, the toolkit about how to do circular economy. But there is a philosophy too. Uh, perhaps we're moving to a world where we do understand complex systems better. And maybe economics will need to reflect that too. It doesn't really at the moment. And at the bottom end of things, you, you don't change systems without the right rules of the game. Now, for decades, people have talked about prices should reflect the full costs, because that helps markets, you know, prices are information. So why, as Walter Steinhoff says, do we tax renewables? Uh, why do we uh, tax people when we should be taxing non-renewables? if we want to discourage their use. The tax system just encourages the displacement of labor and the waste of materials. And one thing I can't go into today, we don't have the time, but for many people, money and finance are in the mix. They're active, not just the finance system as intermediary. And that makes a difference too, because when you want to set the right system conditions, you might want to talk as ex tax does about shifting uh, the tax burden around and one of them said quite coyly what exactly are you going to tax in the era of AI uh, part-time jobs uh, in the era of automation what sense does it mean to tax people you might have to find something else to tax it's not as though it was just a, a radical idea this idea of taxing resource use it's probably something that's going to have to show up anyway. And there's a logic to it. And there's a logic to the use of, and many people I imagine in Dublin and elsewhere will have come across the role of providing uh, complementary currencies. 
and particularly providing it as the, the Scottish government has looked into, are providing uh, money, uh, you know, if you like, a credit, uh, an input, which can be spent on on businesses which are providing goods and services in Scotland. They're beginning to look at that because you need the spending power too. It's not just as the same materials or energy; it's also money. And this, I think, is where we end up. This is where we're headed from, bottom left to top right. These sort of diagrams always end, start from bottom left and go to top right, I think. But it's a process of turning a cycle into a positive, reinforcing, energizing system, rather than saying, here we've got this linear economy, how do we make it less bad? Or how do we make it not get any worse? I think we should be looking forward to these positive cycles although it does require, for my, in my view, a different mindset. So can I, I leave you with that, and I hope there will be some time for us to share a few thoughts, even though uh, I'm several uh, miles away. Okay, thank you very much for that. I'm very delighted to be with you today. And um, I must say that uh, every time I visit uh, Ireland, I feel like home. I feel very nice with you. And uh, I'm very proud of being here in this centre, in which I visited two years ago, mostly talking about plants. And now I see things happening, and that's a great pleasure. I will be speaking about the LIFE programme today. And at the end of my presentation, I want you to think of the LIFE family. Let's see if I can take up this challenge. The LIFE program stretches upon the whole EU. And we work with people from the north, from the south, east and west, with a very clear objective. The objective is to help the environment improving and support the environmental policy. If I could capture in one slide the essence of the LIFE program, that would be this slide. LIFE doesn't focus exclusively on a particular area, but it tr does try to work in the whole span, from nature, biodiversity, ecosystems, up to technology. Therefore, it is very important to know that one of the strengths of the program, it's, it, it, it is its scope and the strengths that we pollinate from one area to the other by networking, by uh, exchanging ideas and uh, results. So far, life has been an evolving story of 26 years and 4,800 projects. These numbers are impressive and based on this legacy, LIFE is considered to be the most historic environmental program worldwide. I would like to talk a little bit about numbers. There was a study recently made for the LIFE program trying to capture what's the big impact of the program. That was uh, a very interesting idea and it proved to be very hard to work on. We have employed many different techniques and conser conservative estimates and we found out that for the LIFE from 2007 to 2013 which is the previous programming period, these 2.1 billion of the LIFE program generated approximately value, not only economic, but if we could project it into economic value, of 50 plus billion euros, which means that a program of that, of such, of, of, of that nature generates 25 the value you invest in, which is a huge uh, benefit. And the most of this value 
is on nature, which is very, very important. Talking about secular economy, as this is the topic today, I'm proud to say that since 1992, LIFE has invested approximately 1 billion euro. And there are more than 700 secular economy projects so far, making it the biggest circular economy program in Europe. People are very interested in live outputs and our publications are very well known. I ask you if you have received this publication. We have uh, on the tables and in the reception desk these publications. This is just for secular economy. And you can find in this publication about a hundred projects on life. This is very important for us to be able to disseminate results and convey the message that one of these projects can serve your needs. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just network with these people and try to replicate results. This is the publication I was talking to you about, The Life and the Circular Economy. And you can download it on the internet if you wish. And not to make you feel bored, this is a very long day for you. I'm trying to blend in a little bit of uh, program information as well as secular economy uh, uh, information and, and the different uh, angles of that. So we have been discussing all day about circular economy ideas and we uh, accept the fact that we need a circular economy transition where sustainable economic models spread through value chains. Not because, it, not because policy makers say so, but because they make business sense. There are also um, elements of multiple bottom lines. We need the social uh, element and, and jobs and growth to um, be present in these, uh, in these models, in these projects. Usually in life we have projects that they focus on resource efficiency and how to divert waste from landfills to back to the economy, to the real economy, like this one that you see in the slide which focuses on ceramic waste, broken tiles, which is uh, transformed into new tiles. And this results in a better product, in a more circular product, in a cheaper product with less environmental impact, which is fantastic. This kind of initiatives we want. So now, how the question is how to change linear business models, especially focusing on SMEs, which is the backbone of the European economy, into a secular one without risking going out of business. So we need different elements there, like upskilling, the social factor, innovation, green financing, strong communication and marketing, and to learn from other people who have done it, from front runners, to harvest government incentives. So there's, there's not just one strategy. There are many strategies which have to work together, all together. And to focus on uh, products to be more sustainable, we have basically to combine the concepts and skills of the old industry and of the new industry, the tech industry. And we have to think of new solutions that will be uh, based on 3D printing technologies, Internet of Things, a whole revolution comes out of that. Big data, green data, artificial intelligence can make a huge impact on circular economy. I remember a few hours ago we've been talking about the problem with uh, the classification uh, of waste Second, second raw materials, uh, which can be uh, defined as, as uh, second raw material waste, which, that can be defined as waste raw material, secondary raw material. And there was a, a representative from the EPA here talking about the uh, uh, long uh, processing time here over there. Thank you. Uh, Shane, right? Yep. Shane. And um, that uh, the application process is very long, very uh, heavy. These elements could be supported by the LIFE program 
for designing IT platforms with artificial intelligence to be able to streamline the workload and to create faster responses to the market. I remember there is a project in the UK of uh, simplifying the administrative procedures for transboundary uh, waste um, shipment and life is not only to, de to deliver a new technology but rather to deliver solutions to certain problems. If the problem is of a governance nature, administrative, then we tackle that as well. So you could probably apply for life funding to tackle that problem and save the money, save time and money for your companies. Uh, this is not something very new has happened again. For example, in the context of the REACH regulation, which talks about chemicals, there is a very lengthy and heavy administrative procedure. And there have been some live projects focusing on how to simplify and make easier for companies to deal with chemicals, saving time and money. So the same could apply here. And LIFE is willing to investigate in such solutions. When I first visited this place, I was shocked by one factor. How nicely, in this project, the bonding of technology and circular economy is, is happening with people's lives, the local communities, jobs. Because we, it's, it's nice if you stand and talk about policies while there are some other people who have no jobs out there. So we have to be able to combine and make this discussion relevant for these people as well. And, and I love this project and I'm proud of it because it is one of the most successful projects in Europe combining environmental elements, environmental impact and social impact. And this is absolutely must. We should not forget the social dimension when we talk about our stuff. So what can life offer to you? LIFE publishes a call for proposals every year, once every year. Now the new call is expected mid-April. And you have to submit a proposal if you want to ask for funding. And in the past we had people saying that ah, that's a long process, it's a heavy investment. We cannot write such a long proposal. Now things have been simplified drastically to the benefit of the potential applicants. And for projects in the uh, environment strand, projects for circular economy ideas, for example, there is a concept node application phase, and then if the concept node is approved, you submit the full proposal. Therefore, what you have to deliver is a simple application of 10 pages. So by mid-June, you have to deliver these 10 pages and it will be evaluated. they will be evaluated. And if life, the LIFE program uh, experts like your idea, then they invite you to submit the full proposal. Therefore, the cost and time and, and, and uh, intellectual investment needed to develop a proposal now is it's very, very small. And LIFE is becoming more attractive. I wouldn't like to waste more of your time. What I want to tell you is that in the LIFE program, we do not just give money. It's not an administrative, solely administrative exercise. We sign contracts, we give you money, we read your reports. It's not like that. LIFE is very much working on passionate people that they have an, uh, a vision. They want to help other people, greening, uh, their city, greening their company, greening their community. Therefore, the officials of the European Commission who work on the LIFE program and all the other experts, the national contact points, the external monitoring team, the national authorities who are in the sphere of LIFE, they work with you. We love supporting and working with you. We are not as any other program. Life is different. Therefore, please 
give it a chance, consider being a member of the Life family. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Pavlos. That's uh, really encouraging to hear. And a big congratulations to all of the Rediscovery team and to, to Sarah, who's, who's led them over the years. Uh, we chatted uh, for a few minutes uh, just before lunch, and uh, you indicated at that point that you thought this was one of the most exemplar kind of projects that you had seen and I think it's very much now about uh, getting that message out and celebrating what uh, what everyone here has managed to achieve. So I'm sure you have uh, loads of questions for both uh, Pavlos and for, for Ken, if we could invite Ken back into uh, the conversation again. Um, can we open the question please to, to, to the floor? Has anybody got a question? Uh, Ken, I, I've heard you uh, mention uh, in a number of podcasts that I listen to, just to find out a little bit more about you, to get a little bit more background, um, about sort of um, uh, pioneering companies who provide services in the form of bundles. Can, I mean, you referred to, in your talk to, to Philips. Can you, can you give us a few other examples just to tell people a bit more about what that is? Well, you mentioned bundles, did you, just then? Yes. Yeah, you've talked about that with the washing machines. Yes, washing machines. You referred yeah. to that before. Yeah. Um, one of the, the classic ones uh, is, of course, uh, power by the hour on the aero engine side of things, where Rolls-Royce have done for decades. They've made sure that they have been able to cut down the amount of servicing required or the making sure that the right part is in the right place because they monitor continually all of the, air, the aero engines in flight all the time. And this package, total care package they have with their products has meant that they can recover high quality materials as well. They can make sure that breakdowns, obviously pretty keen to make sure those are as limited as possible. But it's been extremely successful in terms of resources as well as in safety because uh, the customer gets a mixture of the product and the service. And this is happening uh, more and more, that people are paying for uh, the service as much as they are for an engine. They didn't just buy an aero engine, they bought uh, a version of power by the hour. So the more hours they fly, the more they pay for it. That's just, just one example. The difficulty with some of these models, as I've mentioned before, because Xerox were very early into doing uh, making sure that they, leave, they pay paper copy on your photocopy. Part of the, the problem is that existing management, existing incentives in the firm don't align with the new business uh, model very well. And uh, that's why I'm told that um, at least one car firm's electric division, on which they're basing the autonomous vehicles, was taken out of the main structure because it, it was likely to be to get, uh, if you like, um, uh, under under supported by existing management, it's it is quite a challenge in that, in that you need different contracts, you need different relationships, and there's no easy off the shelf, uh, super fantastic approaches uh, to this that are at all possible. People are trying it out, and I think that's what I find with many of the firms that we deal with. They're actively exploring it because it's no, they know it has potential. But um, I think I, I'm just going to, to, to leave that there. There are about 150 case studies online, but most of them are not around the product of service one yet. Uh, outside those which um, are clearly about upping utilization of shared assets, tool libraries are getting more common, but particularly in places like Vancouver where the housing situation is forcing people into um, smaller and smaller houses so they can't keep the stuff in the, in the apartment. So they have uh, their snowshoes as it were or whatever else they want to borrow in tool libraries. Uh, many more people are monitoring the machines in operation so that you know what the machinery is doing. But uh, not that many have yet gone to fully fledged um, just selling the service. The DuPont have done good work in 
are working with Ford around their spray plants where they take over the spraying of the vehicles and can recover and minimize all of because they know much more about um, chemicals than the Ford people do. They can take over that contract and deal with that and recover lots of the materials. It's the same with some catalysts, which are now not sold to a, to a company, but their use is licensed on the basis that it will be recovered. So there's lots of interesting things going on, but I just want to say it often sounds easier than it is to put it into action. Oh, uh, that sure doesn't mean it say it won't increase uh, rapidly over the next few years as we get experience. Okay, thank you for that. Um, are there any questions for, for, for Ken or for Pavlos? Anna Davies here. Just give us a, a few seconds here, Ken. Uh, the microphone's been passed. Yeah, okay. In the mic. yeah. uh, I actually, I have a question to Pavlos uh, in relation to the live program. Um, I'm a very small company, just a startup uh, started in 2016, and uh, I'm actually struggling with time always. So I have an option either to work or to focus on applying for some funds. I cannot do both at the same time. Uh, I figure out that most of the application forms, and especially on the second stage, uh, uh, is quite complicated. Is there any way you can support the process uh, here in Ireland? Is there any point of contact where you can get an advice how to, how to make this application after the first stage, which is pre pretty obvious, like 10 pages? I would imagine this is quite simple to, uh, to fill it out. Thank you very much. Um. You you should um, think of this as a as a small challenge. It's not a big one. You if you if you are able to set up a startup and and run it and and find with all the dragons out there, a life application is almost a nice pleasant walk for you. <laughs> Therefore. You can perfectly do it alone. If you nevertheless need input, you can start from people in this room that have worked already successfully in the live program. You can talk to Sarah. You can talk to many people here. And you can also talk to the national contact point, the Irish national contact point. And I am confident that you will really quickly solve your questions and just file it in. Sarah, would you like to add to that? I suppose just to add to that, um, the European or the Irish contact point are hosting a meeting on the 27th of April and they'll be providing information for anyone who is thinking about submitting a life application and there is discussions around perhaps being able to provide some support for the companies or the organisations that get past the first stage. So. I think there is a recognition that it's perhaps time consuming, particularly if you are running your own business. Um, so hopefully we will see some resources coming at it from a national point of view. But I would suggest maybe that you go along on the 27th of April and, and talk to the, the people there. Thanks. I, th I, think it's in, I think it's in DIT, is it? There you go. Chartered Accountant's House <laughs> in Pierce Street. Okay. Very there, good. There we go. Thanks, Shane. <laughs> That's service for you. Uh, Anna, did you have a question? No, it was actually related to that. Sorry. Was it? Oh, yeah, oh. and the national uh, contact point is Pat Martin, just in case anybody's um, wanting to contact him. So he's in the Department of the Environment, yeah, and he works with Jean Clark, who was here earlier. So if you talk to either of those two, they'll be able to help you. Okay, I think Shane Colgan, you had a question? No, I was just going to say mention the information. Oh, great. Okay, so Pavlos, you said it's very easy to access the funding. The application process was very straightforward. That's the message I got. <laughs> uh, okay, any more questions, please? Okay, we have one hand up here. Thank you. Uh, I'm not quite sure how I should formulate my question, but I'm in, in the interiors business, I'm an interior designer, and I have an ambition to work more with sustainable materials, sustainable interiors, um, investing in quality, 
clients to kind of maybe invest in a in a piece of furniture that lasts longer that we know but all this is just so tricky <laughs> because it's always the cost issue and i just wonder if there is any thoughts from any of you <laughs> who are more experienced in this area how to if there is any discussion going on how do we tackle this issue of i seem that is quality is cost a lot of money and quantity doesn't and people have a tendency to just buy and not invest in yeah sorry i don't know if i make myself clear <laughs> but uh, ken would you like to respond to that yeah, yeah there's a couple of comments one i think in one way don't worry because the looking at the economy i'm afraid to say it's diverging between the better off 10 or 20 percent and the rest um what you propose to market would probably fit with people who are going to have more income and more, uh, and, and they also have a, a more aspiration to buy the right thing in terms of quality, longevity, and distinctiveness. Now that's just the, uh, the business environment we might be moving into. In terms of the, what the so-called sustainable materials, it's, it really is quite helpful if um, I don't know if you can do it because it costs quite a lot to do this, that you can get cradle to cradle certification, but it's certainly easy to find out what they base their uh, judgment on and to bring that into the business to some extent, because I do think it has an attractiveness to customers that you are both conscious, aware and acting upon uh, the way in which you use materials and the choice of materials, and you can say something about it. I was, I was given an EcoAlf messenger bag. This is from Spain. It's a very high quality bag made out of recovered fishing line, but it is excellently put together. It's a real object to, to show and tell people about. And um, if I had been able to afford it, I would have bought it, and I've used it continuously for a couple of years now. It is a wonderful object, which I can be proud of. So I think there is a market, and it doesn't, in a way, uh, it doesn't put, put, I think you shouldn't put people off like yourself, because you will find that there are people who will buy this, and buy it much more eagerly because of the quality elements. Now that doesn't answer the overall social question, of course, but that might, that, that's, I think, beyond the scope of me or uh, somebody in business who needs to identify their market niche. Uh, it's much more systemic and fundamental that these, these questions around affordability and, and the price of labor and the price of materials. But it can be a useful showcase to say, this is the way the thinking is going. I'm getting more customers, I understand what I'm offering, and I'm able to articulate that in a way that's very contemporary. So I don't know if that helps, um, but it's certainly a direction that's worth sharing with customers, uh, I think, very much so. I think that's a great response. And um, one of the things that um, I, um, I was thinking about when I was looking at sort of those on-demand sharing economies and the, and the new wardrobe model or the uh, Lena fashion library, um, you know, and, and clothing that comes with a story behind it, uh, you know, that has a cachet. And Sarah Miller was, um, uh, she just dropped into the conversation in an email one time that she was going to the BAFTAs, which I thought was pretty amazing. But, uh, you know, the clothing that she wore at the BAFTAs uh, looks stunning, Sarah. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, you know, part, you know, part of her wardrobe that night was from uh, you know working with the team Carrie Ann and the team here in Rediscover Fashion. And you know, if that was part of a lending service, would you much rather wear the clothes that had been sitting beside Helen Mirren than sort of going and buying something new? Uh, you know, so I think sort of having that storyline, but you know, behind the services and, and the products and the materials we choose will become much more important uh, heading into the future. Uh, have we any? Any other questions, please? Yes, the front here. Hello, Davlos. Uh, thank you very much indeed for funding this project. Uh, I was a beneficiary of with, with, with my water system here. Um, uh, a lot of the difficulties that a lot of innovators would have in starting new business is that 
they get to a certain stage. In my case here, proof of concept has been more or less established, but it needs to go on to the next stage then. So um, I presume, I'm just asking you to confirm with this, I presume that a, a, a separate application can be made to move beyond the life of, of a proof of concept to looking at markets and looking at uh, the, the, the feasibility of mass producing the, 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 the product, uh, that would be allowable, even though it's kind of a second tranche of funding for the same, for the same project. Is, is that allowed? Usually, when we finance a project, we expect that it has enough time and budget to go up to the pre-market stage or even to the market. This is technically described as having a higher TRL, technology readiness level, and the high, it goes up to nine, I think. Yeah, in theory, you could apply. Nobody can stop you from applying by demonstrating that you want to scale up. But it will be evaluated by merit compared to all other applications. Therefore, the fact that there is a, a, a application for a continuation or accessing the market doesn't act positively or the other way around. Uh, you have to think, though, that you have to, in such a project, include potential users and prove that life is the only funding source to be able to finance you for that. If it's not the case, the application would not be scored high and it will fail. Therefore, in the application process, you have to pass through several filters. How environmentally focused is your idea? If not, you can go to other funding instruments like Horizon 2020, like the SME instrument phase one, which is basically a small funding for the feasibility studies study. Uh, to get funding from live, one of the elements is that you describe pretty well that based on the uh, nature of your project and the constraints that you have, life is the only way to get funding. Um, for example, if you go to a commercial bank and say, I would like to get a loan, or you go to venture capital and say, listen, I want to grow, would you finance me? If, if there are these options on the table, life is not for you. But if there is no other option, and your project is expected really to have a green impact, significant impact, then come to life. <laughs>